so hello can you hear me yeah. i hope so thanks uh, so i welcome you to my talk uh, about uh, testing tool chain uh, my english is not very good uh, at least spoken english bear with me um, so uh, uh, i'm quite an assurance engineer and uh, i work for tool chain qe and uh, people often uh, are confused about uh, what I do. Uh, they think that uh, I'm QE, that I'm testing packages, and I'm, that I'm uh, finding bugs. Uh, well, that's true, but it's not, uh, you know, the complete truth. Um, what I care about when I'm testing are basically uh, three kind of things. Um, I'm caring about uh, bug fixes. I call them bugs because I used to call everything bug. Even ticket in Bugzilla is a bug and fix is, fix is a bug and feature is a bug. Everything is a bug for me. <laughs> uh, second thing I care about are uh, features. And the third thing, and in my opinion, the most important thing uh, are regressions. Uh, I guess you all know what regression is. Uh, it's um, a uh, bug uh, that um, uh, says you, you know, in previous version it worked and uh, now it uh, doesn't work. Uh, and in my opinion, this is the most important thing. Uh, uh, what about the rest? Um, unless it's uh, something, uh, you know, like uh, really important or some security issue, uh, I don't care that much. Uh, because if there was some minor bug for like 10 years uh, and nobody cared, then it's unlikely uh, anybody will care in, let's say, next year or something like that. So um, uh, that's what I care about. Uh, what is toolchain? Uh, again, maybe you know, but uh, I'll remind you. Uh, toolchain is the thing that uh, allows you to build your application from uh, source code. It's typically compiler, assembler, uh, and linker. But of course, uh, this is uh, not enough for uh, programming these days. So there are additional tools, uh, debuggers, uh, uh, several tracers, profilers, uh, uh, memory error detectors, and so on and so on. Uh, so, you know, I have just few examples, there are uh, many more uh, programs, uh, but uh, I have a few examples on this slide, so maybe you know some of these tools, which you can see. Uh, so, uh, as I said uh, two slides before, uh, I care about uh, bug features and I care about regressions. So how do, how do I uh, test these things? Uh, when uh, the package is uh, updated, uh, it's usually you know, certain meta metadata are associated with it, uh, and those metadata state that uh, back this and this was fixed and there's this new feature. Uh, so first thing, uh, I need to make sure that uh, the package uh, really uh, fixes those issues and those features are really working uh, and you can break sorry uh, you can break something else uh, this is color regression and uh, this is a huge problem because users are usually not happy when uh, something used to work and uh, they update package and it doesn't so uh, for uh, uh, bugs and features, uh, the best uh, thing uh, is uh, if test for this bug or for this feature is part of the test suite. This is not always the case, but uh, uh, it's the uh, best thing because I don't have too much work with it. I just test that the uh, test within the test suite uh, passes. Uh, if it's not part of the test suite or if the test in the test suite is not good enough to test the feature or a bug, I usually have some reproducers um, 
uh, which I run. Uh, they are not part of the test suite, and I write them. I run them in uh, my own environment uh, and uh, maintain them separately. Uh, this is uh, more work for me, but uh, sometimes it's it's better because I can do whatever do I want and um, whenever I want to do something with it. Um, about the regressions, uh, regressions of course are best catch also by test suite because there are uh, hundreds, of in some cases thousands of tests uh, within the test suite. So um, it's um, if there is some regression, that's there is a good chance that test suite will catch it. Uh, but of course, I maintain my own set of uh, tests for each package that for several reasons cannot be part of the test suite. I will talk about it later. Uh, yes, no, not every test can be part of the test suite. Uh, there are several reasons for that. Uh, for example, it's packaging issue or a, a test uh, requires uh, some non-trivial setup. For example, it requires uh, 100,000 users and uh, uh, miss working. So I, that cannot be part of the test suite because the suite is usually uh, run as a part of the part of the rebuild, and it must be uh, really small. Uh, it cannot take half a day to execute. Uh, yes, uh, test suites are not perfect, as I already hinted. Uh, I have uh, this ideal case. What? Um, in my opinion, not only in my, in my opinion, but uh, mainly in my opinion, should uh, ideal test suite uh, look like. Uh, it should uh, first, uh, I should be able to run just a few selected test cases. For example, uh, the, uh, the update fixes three bugs and they, they are part of the test suite and I need to run them more often. And so I cannot wait till all the tests in the test suite uh, just uh, run because it takes an hour and if I do, it, do this too often, it's not uh, very good, it uh, wastes my time. So if uh, I can run just uh, these three tets, tests, uh, it's better. Uh, another thing is uh, ability to run tests on install packages. Uh, a lot of test suites are um, uh, made uh, the way they are actually testing the just uh, built binaries or dynamic share objects. Uh, so it's better if I can just uh, switch uh, switch the test suite uh, so it uh, tests a package that are installed on the system. Uh, ideal test suite should have 100% uh, coverage, but it's uh, never never true, but it would be nice. Uh, another thing is uh, output. Uh, every test suite uh, will just output something, and it should be you know, easy to read. If, it, uh, it's, if something uh, fails, I should be able to quickly tell uh, what test uh, failed, and uh, it should be also easy to parse, for example, by some scripts or something like that. Uh, all tests uh, should be passing all the time. Uh, that's a problem, uh, especially in the uh, tool chain. Uh, most of the test suites, uh, they have some tests that are failing all the time or they are uh, race conditions. Uh, and um, it's quite time consuming because I have to look uh, deeply into this every time and uh, need I need to find out what, what went wrong and if uh, there is no new failure. Uh, I often do it by simply comparing the old uh, test suite of the old package with the test suite uh, of the new package and uh, I'm looking for the differences because uh, um, I don't have any other chance. Uh, it should be built in separate RPM. Yeah, that would be great uh, because uh, it's simply uh, more better manageable, let's say. 
uh, everything goes to the test suite. That will also never be true, but it would be nice if uh, I didn't have to maintain my own uh, tests. Uh, so this is, uh, yes? <laughs> Uh, where I'm using some of uh, maybe easy to read and parse. Maybe I have some test suites like that, and a separate RPM that also uh, some packages from Toolchain have uh, separate RPM. Maybe those two, but the others, it's not the case. Uh, that's a part of RPM that should be uh, just installable test suite. So I would install test suite and uh, run it. It would be better, best. Okay, um, where I am? Yes, here. Reproducers. Yes, reproducers are also not perfect. Uh, in, in this case, I decided to put uh, the actual state. Um, as opposed to ideal, because it's uh, better for explanation. Uh, so what uh, bothers me about the reproducers? Uh, one thing is complicated setup. Uh, of course, uh, when you need to set up a NICE and uh, create uh, thousands of users, it's not, uh, it's not very good, it's manageable, but uh, I obviously would like to have easy setup. So I'll preferably automate it and um, um, yeah, that will be best. Uh, another thing is time consuming setup. This may look like th the same thing, but it's not. Time consuming setup, it's if it's really take uh, like uh, an, a day to uh, compile something or uh, create thousands of users or uh, whatever. Uh, another thing is test suite, test, uh, sorry, reproducers are usually not tested at all and uh, they are not properly written. Uh, people who uh, write um, reproducer usually care about only one thing, obviously, and that is to show uh, there is a bug present. Uh, so they are, um, they are full of bugs, they do not check return values, they are full of uh, really bad habits and bad uh, constructs, and uh, they are failing for many reasons, and uh, most of those reasons are not that they show the actual bug, especially if they become part of the regression test suite or regression tests I maintain, uh, I need to often modify them later on to be um, more robust because uh, they are really bad uh, most of the time. Uh, uh, another thing uh, I am noticing when I getting my hands on test uh, uh, reproducers written by uh, various people is that they try too hard to clean after themselves. Now they clean all the locks and they even go as far as to catch uh, segmentation violation and return one uh, and other things. And uh, this is bad because uh, I'm having a hard time to find out uh, what uh, really went on when the test was running. And um, That's about it. Um, Non-minimal test cases. Uh, this happens when uh, somebody will point you to the uh, several hundreds uh, <coughs> megabytes uh, big tarball with some Java stuff. And for example, the only point is that um, when you when you run it uh, with Java under Valgrind for several hours, uh, there, there will be, uh, you know, 
unrecognized instruction or something like that. You know, this could be tested within several seconds and uh, uh, so this is also a problem and I need to make the test case more minimal so to be able to test it on all architectures and to be able to test it often. Um, and last thing, what I call test suite effect is um, uh, the similar thing, but uh, not quite the same. Uh, when um, upstream or maintainers accept, uh, accept uh, test cases to the test suite, uh, they usually require uh, them to be small and isolated for obvious reasons. Uh, I already mentioned test suite must run, for example, for after every rebuild and uh, it must not take uh, too much time. Uh, so this is uh, obvious prerequisite uh, for uh, tests to be uh, added to, to the test suite. Uh, but uh, some issues are simply too complex and they cannot be tested within uh, several seconds or uh, not even minutes. Uh, so if I get such a test, it's not good enough for me and I need to or I should create my own tests. Yeah, last thing that maybe it should be on another, another slide is that uh, one important thing to realize is that reproducers shows, uh, reproducers show, I have a mistake there, bug. Uh, reproducers show symptoms, uh, not, uh, not actual bugs. Because, um, you know, you may have bug there in your application uh, for years and it will not manifest itself. Uh, it just uh, manifests through symptoms and if they are not there, the bug is still <laughs> there and you don't know about it. So this is uh, dangerous. When I, is, uh, when I say something is fixed, it may not be actually fixed, but I see um, test case passing, uh, reproducer passing, but um, it may not be good enough. Yeah, uh, this is a famous quote by uh, famous uh, Dutch computer scientist Edgar Dijkstra. Uh, he says testing shows the presence and not the absence of the bugs. That's, uh, that is what I was talking about. Uh, uh, really, testing cannot um, show you uh, there is not a bug. Uh, unless it's a really trivial case, but in non-trivial cases, uh, even really good test, even really good test case, and even really good reproducer may not be enough. Uh, now uh, to the bugs. Uh, obviously, a reproducer is uh, uh, trying to show you uh, some symptom, uh, and if that uh, symptom shows, it means there is a bug somewhere. And uh, bugs can be also somehow categorized to several categories. Uh, I do not have uh, links to some, to some research papers uh, at the end of the presentation, but uh, if you Google those, uh, uh, those names, you will, you will find it easily. Uh, uh, what I really like, what uh, kind of bugs I really like are so-called hard bugs or bore bugs because uh, these bugs are really uh, easy, easily, to repro easily reproducible and uh, when you run it 100 times, it will, you will see failure 100 times and it's uh, really awesome because they can be uh, reproduced at will and uh, you don't spend too much time on it usually. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, not all bugs uh, belong to, to this category. There are also so-called soft bugs or uh, mandel bugs. Uh, sometimes they are called like that. Uh, and these bugs, um, so easy, they often uh, exhibit, um, you know, unpredictable behavior or non-deterministic non behavior. Uh, there are sometimes you see failures, sometimes you don't. And uh, you are actually uh, never sure you just uh, guessing, you may, if you are testing uh, that bug like this is gone, 
you need to try really hard enough and uh, really uh, let the test uh, mm, running for maybe even days or try it on many machines and so on. So it's not, um, I really don't like these bugs. Uh, they are hard to test. Uh, mm, Eisen bugs, these, so these soft bugs, this uh, very special, uh, uh, very special category. Uh, these are bugs that uh, are uh, playing hide and seek with you. Uh, when you encounter such a bug and you try to locate it uh, with some tool, for example, uh, GDB or Estrace, Valgarin, whatever, uh, they, they suddenly disappear. Uh, and um, uh, this is really hard when you want to, for example, report such a bug. You have a hard time to finding out uh, what the cause is or what sh against uh, what um, component you should uh, uh, you should report them. Uh, there are several reasons for these uh, kind of bugs. Um, no, I guess primary reason uh, is uh, race condition. Uh, this uh, actually happens when a program assumes some order of execution, but that order of execution is not um, defined or not, not guaranteed. And uh, this may take um, days to, to trigger it. And it's really hard to find and it's really hard to test. Uh, another reason is um, corrupted memory. Uh, especially in C and C++, uh, this is um, a huge problem. That's why uh, there is um, so many tools that uh, uh, try to help you uh, to catch uh, these kind of bugs, but uh, uh, some programmers don't use them. But in, in toolchain, this is not, not a big problem. Uh, but um, these kind of bugs can um, have this uh, not so good property that they often uh, show with a delay. Uh, you corrupt something on, on the stack and it's um, some, I don't know, call it safe register and uh, it will be restored later and it will cause uh, failure not where uh, the bug actually is, but uh, sometime later, sometimes minutes or hours, and sometimes they don't show up at all. So. If you, if you are using Algorand, you are also not uh, completely, um, you cannot completely catch them, at least not all of them. Uh, because, um, for example, Valgrind, uh, what it does, it, um, uh, it basically takes your program in binary form, uh, disassemble it, and uh, insert uh, its own instrumentation. Uh, after that, the program is assembled again, and uh, this uh, result is uh, run on the, on the CPU, uh, on the computer, and the Valgrind, the, the core and the two, uh, the Valgrind to using, is also part of the other space of the application. So Valgrind and application you are running under Valgrind uh, lives in the same same process uh, and uh, so you can easily uh, layout uh, completely different memory layout and uh, the bug may not manifest. Uh, for example, Valgrind is um, inserting uh, zones uh, on, on Uh, main Valgrind tool, when you are running uh, Valgrind, you are actually running memcheck, which is the default tool. It uh, catches, uh, catches uh, bugs like uh, uh, use of initialized memory and uh, heap uh, overruns uh, and so on. Uh, 
only 16 bytes. So 20, uh, then Valgain may not catch it. Uh, as said before, in memory layout is also a problem, and you can you can even corrupt the Valgain itself. So uh, it sort of a ballot, but um, it may also happen that uh, the bug uh, shows when you are running application normally, but it doesn't show under Valgrind and, and uh, vice versa. Uh, sometimes Valgrind crash. Um, it's not entirely different thing, but uh, I don't. I didn't want to name uh, list all the all the various things. So. Uh, the presence of undefined behavior on reliance on unspecified behavior within programs can cause also manifest in these Heisenbachs. Uh, it's a uh, it's really good idea for every C and C++ programmer to be aware of it because, uh, for example, even GCC may miscompile your, your C code and uh, uh, you, it's actually your fault, and uh, uh, it's a function prop. At least, for my purposes. Uh, um, also. something clear, you know, there's a box so we, uh, and, uh, but it's not uh, that clear. Uh, first question is whether it's even a bug. That's first question for every And um, after that, uh, also nothing is clear yet. Uh, question is where the bug is located. Uh, this is not in this order. It may be uh, the other way around, but uh, these are uh, questions that needs to be answered every uh, bug report. And when uh, the bug is located, uh, question is also who should fix it, and therefore who should uh, test it. Every every maintainer has uh, its uh, QE, so after he fix it. Uh, somebody will test it afterwards. Uh, oops. Uh, so that's about it. Okay. Uh, what can be done or what I do or what I'm planning to do uh, when I'm actually thinking about testing? Uh, about the first category I mentioned about uh, bugs are f and features uh, are part of the update. Uh, the things I do or I should do usually, uh, sometimes I don't have that much time, but if I do, I should, for example, minimize our producers. Uh, I already mentioned that tarball or something. Uh, another thing is extend existing our producers that uh, I should do when I feel or uh, I'm afraid that the reproducer is simply not enough and it does not uh, cover the uh, bug fix or feature properly. Uh, I can extend existing sanity test or I can extend uh, some regression reproducer, whatever suits me. Uh, the last thing is uh, create a missing and uh, uh, missing test that uh, that happens when nobody will give me a reproducer and I, I have just some uh, description that doesn't go too deep and I need to uh, find a way to test something. Uh, the uh, category regressions, these, these are things I'm afraid the most. Uh, the actual component, you know, some components have a very good uh, test suite coverage and uh, this is not that much, that big problem, but uh, some, some components 
uh, have a really weak test suites and um, when some regression happens, I'm really afraid I'm not able to catch it. Uh, so what uh, I should do when I have time is to create some stress tests. And um, there they may be stress tests of several kind. Uh, for example, uh, first uh, a data point is too many of everything. What I mean uh, by it is, uh, for example, too many processes or uh, running uh, uh, a really long time or uh, having too many users or uh, asking, uh, calling some function too many times and so on. Uh, these are things that usually within the test suite or uh, within the regular testing are not, uh, not covered. Uh, but on the real system with the real users, uh, these scenarios often happen. That, uh, for example, I don't know, this university may have uh, 50,000 students. Let's say they all log into one system. You know, uh, my tests usually do not run uh, on, on such system. And so there might be, this is uh, less traveled part, be some regression in it. So uh, this is actually a good thing to, to create some tests that um, uh, uh, stress the, uh, the component and test it uh, with, with some extreme values. Uh, another thing uh, what um, usually um, escapes the testing is, uh, you know, error uh, error path. Uh, error paths are usually not uh, not covered because when application works normally, error path is never executed. But uh, there might be bug in error path, and it might be actually a very bad, uh, very bad thing. It might have it might have uh, severe consequences. Uh, so it's uh, also good to create tests that uh, stress uh, application by forcing error path to, to be taken uh, by technical fault injection. Uh, it's, uh, it might be done with tools like system tap or similar. And it basically calls some, some library function or some other thing to, to fail and force um, error path to be taken. Uh, uh, the last thing uh, with uh, stress testing is run, uh, run the test, uh, run the existing tests uh, with some ellipsy to zero or memory upon allocation or upon the allocation. And uh, uh, if I run test with, uh, thanks. <laughs> if I run test with this, uh, I have higher chance of uh, catching, catching something. But uh, this may also obscure bug, Heisenbug that, uh, uh, that would uh, manifest itself in, in a real, a real environment. So I cannot rely only on uh, this. This is something uh, special, not uh, default, uh, default testing environment. Uh, yes. Uh, so one, one way to create uh, two test regressions are via stress test. And another thing is by comparing old and new version. As I already mentioned, I of I'm often comparing test suites and uh, sometimes I rely on static code analysis uh, or dynamic binary analysis. The binary analysis is, uh, for example, Walgreens, already mentioned a few times, uh, and static code analysis is, for example, CPP check. I'm not doing this as I would wish. So, for example, this is one thing I would like to focus uh, in the future. Uh, you know, the static code analysis is uh, much easier because uh, first it, uh, 
it's actually I don't need any 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 data. I can just run it all source tree and new source tree and compare the results, and uh, it's easy. Uh, whereas in case of dynamic uh, dynamic binary uh, uh, but um, anything that can happen is just usually Uh, it's often not the case. So in the future, for example, I would like to focus on this. And the thing is, you know, sometimes there are properly. Uh, what can I cut at the point? So um, there are two chain, so we can have advantage because we can do tools and um, I have just few examples of tools that we, uh, we sometimes use, system tab, login, GDB and so on. Uh, if I can uh, Let's say a few examples. Uh, for example, we have a bug that some uh, uh, it was not uh, exactly error part, but it was it was fallback uh, within glibc that uh, when uh, some system call was not uh, available for for some reason, that another uh, another. Er and the path in the code in glibc was executed so uh, to the user program it would look like like it, it worked so there were two paths first path uh, for uh, case where a system call is uh, available and another path for the fallback code that computes the valu value if the system call is not available so I n there was a bug in the in the fallback, but normally it was uh, not possible to force it, uh, force the fallback to execute. So what I did, I created small, small system tab script. Uh, in case you don't know, system tab is a tool that allows you with some scripting language to, to build. Uh, uh, kernel module insert it to kernel and. Uh, uh, either observe the state of, uh, of a running system or even uh, change the states, for example, some vari variables and so on. So I created small system tab script. It was like five lines and that system tab script uh, forced, uh, forced kernel to, to uh, forced uh, the kernel system call to fail uh, so that uh, the tested Part in glibc could be taken. Uh, if I didn't have system tab, I would have to probably build uh, build uh, uh, my own broken version of kernel. So this is one thing that's very useful. Uh, this is basically example of fault injection. Uh, another thing is Valgrind. I can run pretty much uh, uh, anything under Valgrind. Uh, it's especially useful when you want to confirm some memory leaks are gone and so on. You know, a, a lot of people think that memory leaks are uh, worst kind of bugs, but uh, they are really not. Uh, GDB, this is useful either also as for uh, fault injection, but it can be useful to test uh, risk conditions because you have, uh, when you are running program under GDB, you have absolute control o over what happens and you can force the right order of execution so the, the bug is triggered. Uh, but of course you need to know what to do and this is sometimes problem. Uh, glibc, I already mentioned, um, glibc allow to, um, uh, allows, um, 
user to specify certain uh, environment variables and those environment variables uh, controls the, the code within GVPC. There are two main um, areas. Uh, one is allocator uh, and the other is uh, dynamic linker. Uh, so for example, I can, uh, with some env environment variable force uh, checking of uh, heap or I can uh, with another environment variable uh, specify that uh, alloc memory allocated even via a malloc uh, will have a certain value and the memory free uh, with free will have uh, also certain value. Uh, another tools like CPP check SPLint, uh, these are uh, tools for statical analysis, this can be sometimes helpful when I know for sure there is a bug somewhere, but uh, mm, I don't know exactly where the bug is, uh, uh, so this can help me pin the location. Uh, okay, uh, another thing I have here, I hope the last, is uh, um, we know what can go wrong because uh, you know the software bugs, uh, there, there's nothing uh, new about them. They often occur um, again and again and people are making the same kind of mistakes over and over again and it's uh, actually very repetitive. Uh, so uh, when I know these kind of bugs, I can even specifically search for them or I can create some tests that will that will search for them. There, there might be things like um, difference in uh, in ABI. This is for one difference in, in uh, available syscalls. Uh, these two first two are actually a reason why we are testing for every architecture, at least main reason, because the, the, these things uh, really vary and. Uh, uh, there's different AB, uh, ABI and different uh, syscalls with different numbers and different Arno values on, on, um, on, for example, PowerPC as opposed to Intel. So uh, if the code is uh, has bug or is badly written, this this can show, uh, for example, only on uh, on um, I don't know on a risk machine. Uh, there's also you know. Uh, all the things that are part of ABI, I, I'm afraid I don't have a time to list all those issues. Uh, memory erro errors are already mentioned. We, we have Valgrind. Uh, we have also Matflap, but uh, this, this is part of GCC, but uh, this is similar thing to Valgrind. Uh, it uh, also checks the, the memory issues, but uh, it's, it's kind of obsolete. Uh, because last time I tried it, it had really too many false positives. For example, Valgrind uh, tries very hard to not to bother its user about false positives and try to show, for example, only first error as and suppress all errors that uh, are obviously derived from that first error. Uh, Modflap really probably doesn't do anything like that, so it's full of uh, uh, full of useless uh, messages and it's hard to use. Uh, fortunately, there has been some replacement. Uh, it's called address sanitizer and uh, I believe it will be part of uh, GCC 4.8. And I'm running out of time, so that was last slide anyway, so if you have any question, feel free to ask. No questions, great. For testing what application? Graphical applications. Uh, uh, yeah, I heard about some some uh, tools like that, but we don't usually use it because in tool chain now now we have things like Eclipse. But uh, uh, aside from that, we do not test uh, graphic applications uh, so much. I know there's something like 
Doctail for GTK, and there are things like um, SWT bot for Java, but I do not have much experience with this. Okay, thanks. Another question? Because, uh, yeah, we, we have really out, uh, out of time because uh, there are other talks after you, so we need to end now. Yeah.